Hi everyone. And um, I mean, thank you, Ruth, for inviting me to be a part of this very pleasant day. Um, I will. Okay, it's. I will try to talk about interconnectivity and uh, from its concept to um, introducing two of my projects that have, let's say, interconnectivity as a form or as a method in its application. And um, I mean, interconnectivity, or in another word, everything is connected, is, is quite an obvious statement, but it's the hardest to prove. In a way, it is, yeah, um, in a way, it's um, because it is very kind of agreeable, it then needs to be articulated in depth. Maybe first I start by introducing myself. I'm Photoshistek, I'm a curator and writer based in London and I'm um, independent, currently involved in the next Guangzhou Biennale opening in September this year. And uh, I've been working on several different projects over a decade, uh, a decade and um, the two of them that I will introduce you today are research, artistic research slash production projects that took place over a long period of time from two to two and a half years. Anyway, first maybe I start with uh, kind of speculating about what interconnectivity might be or what, how could we talk about it. Perhaps maybe we need to introduce some kind of specificity to the sentence of like everything is connected. Maybe we could say that everything is connected across their scales of reference, if that makes sense. Um, if we would explore together, like we live in a macro scale universe and our perception is limited to a certain range of movement and we cannot, we cannot uh, you know, per perceive molecules forming, let, al let alone electrons spinning, but surely we can observe that their presence, although we have to cross the, over the excitation threshold of speculation in order to draw the complete picture. Perhaps states of interconnectivity changes according to the conditions in which it is traced. For instance, the molecular speed we measure on Earth is faster than, the than it is in the universe due to very low temperatures. Hence, the object relation and the universe attains different features than what we would record with plain eye. And yes, they're all made of atoms, but it's not enough to convince us that everything is connected in a way that everything affects one another. In Gaian theory or in Gaian principle, we influence the earth as well as we are influenced back. It's a symbiosis of human and non-human forces. And it's a mutual contribution to our surrounding. In Robert Walser's words, what we understand and love, understands and loves us also. Although interconnectivity cannot be a mere reciprocity of cause and effect, give and take, push and pull, trigger and intrigue, if it was, we could have very well used one of these words instead. Hence, interconnectivity is beyond two or three dimensional relationships. It must be a web of relations that grow horizontally, vertically, and across the XY axis. Perhaps neurons or the neural structure is a good analogy of picturing what interconnected tissue looks like. But we are not trying to find an image for this abstract concept or a visual translation. Perhaps we need a sensual attainment to it in order to stomach it. How can we talk about something when we are in it? This could be another paradox. So the first project I will introduce is called Infra. And I initiated and led with the other curator, Anna Gritz, also based in London. And we aimed at exploring the fact that everything is connected to look, through looking into depths of human knowledge and articulations, manifestations of the world around us. The project was structured around the method of sit-in and where with six artists and uh, writers we sat in existing classes and attended workshops throughout one year. 
The project recently concluded uh, with a lecture event at Westminster Reference Library in London, where Ruth was one of the attendees. And the lecture event had a similar structure to this one, where we had a yoga instructor who talked to the audience about mindfulness. And then we had a neuroscientist who talked about cognitive uh, processes of sending and receiving message or, or understanding, you know. And then lastly, we had um, this speculative text about the construction of real space and time in simula simulation games by an avatar of the uh, academic who wrote the text. So it has been, um, and then, okay, I should maybe in introduce who the group was. So the group was composed of uh, Aura Zutz and um, Ian Whittlesey, Karen Kilberg, and Ruben Henry. We also had John Cousins and Cecil Hines uh, mention uh, in the group, but uh, they disappeared after a while. So let's do this. Do we need uh, sound or? Oh. Okay. 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 Start the details again. of the process of the coming year was a complete mystery. You missed the process. Sorry. Perfect. <laughs> I hope you got it. Uh, so, sorry for that. We were invited to take part in a project called Infra, I-N-F-R-A. The plan was to sit in on established formats and knowledge distribution and activities. Everything would be connected. Otherwise, the details of the process of the coming year was a complete mystery. Session 1. On the trail of the Masonic in central London, we met ourselves at the Temple on Open House Day, yet the Mason's door was still closed. We found geometric shapes on pavements and curves in the vicinity. One man's pipe or sewer demarcation is known as a mystical symbol. We also brought our own favourite geometric shapes and lined them up on the trip to the Crusader. We ate risotto and lotter. <laughs> Session 2. On the trail of Gertrude, we met Gordon. People like him, said Gordon. We thought he would talk about Gertrude, but instead he played Gertrude. He gave us numbers which signify our personality type. Only prisoners have numbers. Gordon said he knew immediately there was a moment number nine in the room. Gertrude was a number nine, charismatic, with a violent gravitas which gathers legions of followers. Gordon tried everything he could to be number nine. We ate takeaway sushi. Session three. On the trail of dog matter, we went to a physics lecture in which teenagers scribbled down incoherent lines of numbers and symbols. We went to the lecturer's office and asked for a physicist, no less, where he told us he was searching for the perfect universe, the mathematically perfect mean universe, which is the most like all of the others. This universe, he said, is an ideal universe and does not exist. They are all different. We ate fancy green salads and exotic grains and finished with green tea ice cream. Searching for on the trail of primal expression, we went to a five rhythms dance class. I let go. People rolled on the floor. An old lady shadow boxed into the corner. A man with a ponytail should have controlled his package if he wanted to make those hip movements. The next day, I recalled the night to a friend. He said, you mean rainbow rhythms, to which I replied, no, five rhythms. And he said, watch the episode of Peep Show and you'll see what I mean. I watched it and I saw what he meant. The whole evening was represented there in perfect synchronicity. Not only the characters, but marked in a dialogue. Pain disease to be that chance. I'm not really here. It's research. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. It seemed the perfect strategy for absent presentness. We had Vietnamese food with Coca Cola. Session five. On the trail of the perfect match, we visited Cambridge for a statistic lecture. Our teacher demonstrated how one might design a system to match, for instance, a number of couples, all based on their preferences. Questions such as, what if their preferences are misguided, were given in response to blank look. It was a perfectly played theatre of cunning refusal to sociological facts in a mathematics class. My initial annoyance turned to respect, and it reminded me of an anecdote about Chip Norris, that he has no concept of time, and when in his house you stand up and say, it's time for me to go, he just stares at you blankly until you sit back down. <laughs> we ate a selection of roasted meats and winter vegetables in the Grand Hall. Session 6. On the trail of changing the rules, we went to a lecture on making new laws. The lecturer used the example of criminalising the passing or receiving of HIV. Can one legally choose to receive a disease? We learnt that the making of a new law is dependent on the literary merit of a past case and is reporting in the press. We departed without food. Session 7. Go! We went to learn Go at the Go Club. Go! 
It's not like chess. We don't take pieces, we take domains. It was so abstract that by the time we finished, we didn't know who had won. One needs to look through the ball, relax the eyes, an aesthetic appreciation of the best route to successful play. Do you see it yet? We snapped throughout the session on crisps and beer. Session 8, wonder session. I missed this session, but the image I had is six people in a garden shed meditating, and the teacher perhaps touching more than he should have. <laughs> I apologise for having no substantiation for my reflection on this session. I have no idea what was eaten. Session 9, the game missed. A visit to the hospital museum usually only open to medical students, pickled babies and the like, and a talk about infectious tropical diseases. I hope that nothing was eaten. On top of the nine sessions, there were three extraneous elements. One, New Year rituals, where semi-meaningless shapes were melted into semi-meaningful shapes, and the whole pencil was used to draw sea creatures in a reenactment of rituals of South Sea sailors, the shavings of the pencil blown ceremoniously from the end of a trumpet. Two, the visit to Goldfinger's house, where we showed that we are different heights. Three, retreat. In the Lake District, we retreated back to basics to design a deck of cards in reflection of the previous sessions. We were proved to be bad neurons, bad portrait drawers, and quite good at being the same height. <laughs> yeah, so basically we did what he summed up. And um, it was like this whole idea of infra also comes from actually actually the champion concept of infra mints, you know, the dust that collects in, in the pocket of your shirt or the warm seat on a bus that, that you take over from, from the you know former passenger. And uh, we I mean maybe I should also like give out this one. So you could also just like uh, open it. And so what happened is uh, basically we allowed ourselves to engage with a content that we are not familiar with. And I think it's a very important part of research where you allow strangeness to come into your domain of perception in order to expand your understanding of something in a bigger scale. And um, we didn't prove that everything is connected, it's not possible. But what we did instead is we came up with this publication, which is a deck of playing cards without any set of rules. And the deck of cards are collectively produced by individually marked somehow. So everybody brought in their content from what they thought or felt that kind of reflects on the experience of infra, but also at the same time, it's, um, it has a different tangent. And um, so we were also interested in this idea of like um, allowing ourselves to engage with knowledge that's already out there, but we are not, you know, ac accessing continuously. So, and the uh, other project that I want to introduce is the one former, again, I did with a group of um, artists, curators and writers in London. That took place over two and a half years. And that was called Time Capsules and Conditions of Now. And again, for this project, um, this time I brought... Um, just, yeah. Perfect. I brought a group of again based in London, artists from various different backgrounds who basically my interest was like um, artists practicing in the field but also at the same time they have a practice that they are engaged in. For instance, um, Wanda Playford, she's an artist but she's also a practicing GP. Ola Hagen is an artist but he's into meditation or uh, Kaz is also an artist and a yoga teacher. Lisa is an artist and a writer. So it was important to kind of bring in a different bread of interest in order to trigger a research about what is time and what is now. So 
the premise of time capsules and conditions of now was to investigate if it's possible to be present in the present moment or what's happening and what is the concept of time and for me concept of time is a construct and how do we explore that so what happened is like the group met in this um, and it was screen perfect the group met in this pub uh, before that, I bought them um, two set of books. One is the book by Julian Barber, it's called The End of Time, Next Revolution in the Universe. And then the other is by Antonio Tobuki, Requiem, a Hallucination for a Dream. So this was posted to the addresses without any um, sender information. And then afterwards, we met at the pub where I wrote each of them a letter, also like introducing them the project. Um, oh, sorry. I'm using my, oh, this is a bit mixed up. Hmm. It's nice to have five keyboards. Okay, I have to maybe stroll down. What happened? Because maybe there are different formats, you think? That's why it opened there or here. Yeah, yeah, maybe I think it's there. Okay, maybe I'll show this one and we can always go back to that one. So anyway, so they read there letters and afterwards we had a tournament on you know table soccer and then the first event was we actually went to Sorsone Museum in uh, Holborn Fields and uh, for this the, uh, for this project the structure was rather than you know like rather than the f like uh, um, rather than like going and sitting and being immersed into something the group had to initiate the whole experience. So every encounter was custom tailed by one of the participants of the group. So for instance, for this visit to Sir Sohn Museum, Ole Hagen was responsible of what, how we will encounter the museum. So he came up with a, actually a brilliant uh, fictional narrative where we did also confuse the general audience of the museum because we had this like blank pages and we had to look at the dots where we had to imagine that actually it was infinity that was going through our mind and um, and then afterwards we had to draw this time maps and then on top of the ancient Egyptian uh, depiction of time that is engraved in the Egyptian tomb, again present in the Sarasone Museum. Uh, and then afterwards we were tracing T.S. Eliot, so that was this time when the Playford who took us to the church that T.S. Uh, Eliot served as a ward for the last 12 years of his life. And um, and we did, uh, and uh, Wanda is also interested in shamanism and Mexican healing techniques, so we had a small ritual in the church. And afterwards we went to the pub that uh, Elliot always goes after his church service. So we had a pub dinner while Wanda asked us to write a story, a personal story about time on um, machine rolls. So, and then after everybody wrote that, and then we read to each other, the images are really bad, I'm sorry for that. And then what we did was, um, we put them in a box and uh, went to Hyde Park because we had to throw it into uh, water, like a lake or some kind of a pond or puddle. So we threw it to the swans, but then there were helicopters coming, so we had to run away. Um, <laughs> And then we did a shamanic weekend where we learned how to journey with a shaman and the introduction to shamanism. And there was a, this, was, this project was a lot of like bridging, let's say, the scientific way of producing knowledge about time with esoteric and spiritual understanding of what time is and what is presence. So this one also included dancing in the park where we kind of shamed ourselves. Or this one was, um, we actually met Julian Barber. We visited him at his house and we brought him plants because in his book, it's a very beautiful book and very nicely written. In his book, he also um, proves that time doesn't exist in his own structural way of talking about gravity and entropy as a, as a dual force. 
So while, while we were talking about time, we wanted to plant flowers in his garden so that there's also like, because time is also about the measure of change and this, you know, kind of a continuous change. This is Jude and Barber and uh, us trying to find out where to plant the things. And then we went to Ford Museum, of course. So one of the group members, Jean Matty, was guiding the session. So she took us uh, individually in front of the famous sofa and we had a psychoanalytical experience. Uh, of course, we went to the Buddhist center, uh, did meditation, and these images are gone. So there's another one. And then we also went to a 10 day silence retreat in Hertfordshire. Uh, I don't know if you know this one, it's called Vipassana and uh, basically you are in silence for 10 days and you meditate, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You wake up at 4, you start meditating at 6 and you sleep at 9.30. So this is before, this is after. <laughs> and um, okay, and then, and okay, and then so this was only the research part. Oops. It was amazing. <laughs> we all lost also like half of our body weight, uh, fat, like literally. Um, so this was only the research part and then we did an exhibition and we made a publication as well which I can also start passing um, yeah perfect so the exhibition took place at the David Roberts Art Foundation in London and for the exhibition of course we didn't want to bore the audience with like oh this is how much fun we had and you know like uh, that's what we ate uh, so what we wanted to do was like to kind of convey a similar experience to the audience without necessarily justifying our grounds of how we collected that information. So in a way, the exhibition was um, uh, directed to an imaginary audience who engages with the um, structure as we engaged with the encounters of like Sorsone Museum or Freud Museum or going to a 10 day retreat. So this is the space and we started with a performance and that was a performance by Lisa Skouret where she was actually talking about blind spots as a concept in the exhibition space. And then this was the uh, launch and the talk of the um, publication because the publication is also another body where seven of us got together and this was more like merging it so if you would open it actually it's a two-dimensional leporello so you can't close it anymore <laughs> So if you fold it in different configurations, you can find each contribution. A <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you want me to do it? Okay. I like this one. It's almost like a performance act. So which one would you like? Maybe a cartoon? So if you would fold this like that. Um, really good. Perfect. That's actually a story and uh, it says, I, Cloudface, announce the implosion of the all possible Oh, okay, it goes there. Now, sorry, it's been a while since we published this one. Into a diamond dwarf of infinite an uh, angles mirroring unfinished angels. 
or it becomes um Ah, this one is very nice actually. This is the easiest contribution. So this is like the, um, it's actually a revisiting of the golden record where we sent our five favorite objects to outer space. That's what we think should remain. So. <laughs> And if I can talk you to the exhibition, so there were different um, pieces. One of the participants of the group was uh, is Chilean, so she had to go to Chile at some point. So she became our parallel universe. So after each meeting, we sent her all the information of the encounters, and she wrote this kind of tape story where in the exhibition you would pull it out and then you had to st stroll it back. So this is how the exhibition looked. These are like kind of sculptures with departed sensory uh, structures, because it's also like oh, uh, it's also you know the reception of time or being in the now is a very sensory perception. And um, so, uh, so this was also like there's a text that actually cuts across. It was a space in two floors, so it cuts across. And then also the column, actually it's an inordial point, and that was my height, where, where you stand on a, just on one single spot, you can continue to read the text. And then, for instance, there's the mountain shouting, or, you know, the eyes of the sculpture is actually on the paper he's reading. Oh, that's the text that comes down. And then we also had audio pieces where you could see the exhibition in five different ways where it wouldn't talk about the objects, but it would talk about different experiences. So like kind of synesthesia, if, if you know, like this kind of deprivation of various senses into one that people hear colors and, you know, like, or you would say red and then they would imagine a letter and things like that. So maybe... I finish here. Do you have questions? Do you think the exhibition, like, did it succeed in communicating what you've done? Because I know from making things, even individually, but also, especially with groups, you come up with a kind of uh, a rationale for things, um, you know, and a whole logic about what you're doing. Mm. And then it's quite interesting to have them share that. But Very abstracted, you know. and do you think it became like that? Like, so things can be in a different way, and it might just work really well in the exhibition anyway. Yeah, no, but this was an exhibition. Work to what you, no, we didn't want it, and I think that was also <coughs> part of this like long research where it's the luxury of us, you know, doing all this like great things and having the experience without necessarily justifying and at the same time keeping it as a treasure for ourselves and it doesn't necessarily need to be present in what we say to the world although it is related or it is based on those experiences like the texts for instance or you know um, they had a lot of elements from what happened in the group throughout uh, one and a half years but we didn't want to carry it to the exhibition at all. And you could see the exhibition on its own as an exhibition that is dedicated to time and conditions of now. Did all the artists make work individually? Yeah, they made individually. Now, we first uh, had this uh, utopian idea of like, let's do something together. <laughs> It's better this way. <laughs> well, why was it important that they were artists rather than just individuals working in different fields? I mean, this is an artistic research project, so in the first place, we are interested in the visual articulation and elaboration of concepts. Mm -hmm. So it was important that they are artists, but or they're, you know, like they're at least involved or engaged in kind of a practice that is within the art.
this group, we had one person who fell out. Or like in the last project, there's two people who fell out. And so in a way, it's also about like, I mean, group work is very um, productive, very exciting, but at the same time, very hard and stress, you know, like stressful and, and demanding. And there's all this like different egos and different ways of relating to the world where if you would, you know, prioritize or substantiate your own private views over others, then you can't work in a group. And, you know, so in that sense, you can't also have significant connections because you're more interested in your own way of connecting, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.